the, uh, the computer turned off for a minute. Is everybody back on okay? Thumbs up? Okay, good. Well, for the message. So Ascension Sunday, a mystical Sunday. We watch Jesus rise, and then our, I don't know, humorously said, what are you looking at? We watch Jesus rise after we have heard Jesus say some strange things as he prays to his Father. He prays directly to his Father, leaving us to hear him offer his words and his prayers, his thoughts. Of course, as a reality, rising up, anti-gravity, going to who knows where, this is a reality we have difficulty accepting and more difficulty understanding. In Acts, we hear Jesus' last words to the disciples. His last things on earth, his instruction. Be my witnesses, starting here, moving ever outward, in fact, to the ends of the world. At the tomb, Jesus' words were, don't hang on to me, don't cling to me. And it's quite clear as Jesus rises on Ascension Day, there is no clinging We'd like to have Jesus with us forever and ever. After all, he is resurrected. Jesus is alive. But no. No, Jesus is going home to his Father. We are here in this ten days of a lost presence, shall we say, here on earth. We're assured that we wait. The Holy Spirit is coming. Jesus' power will be with us. Jesus has said he'll always be with us. But seeing him leave in such a way, well, leaves us more than speechless. So we will rely on the Holy Spirit as our guide for the future, not clinging to Jesus. Yes, we'd like to still lean on Jesus as we negotiate the travails of life, to let go and let God, but should we just do that? Is that our calling here? Again, Jesus tells the followers, tells us in so many words, not to hold on to him post-resurrection. So this Holy Spirit thing that's coming puts us in the middle. It's a mix of relying on God, trusting in God, but letting our conscience and our reason lift us up in the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do the things Jesus asks us to do. To confront the world and its challenges. Of course, this is a scary thought for me because I can twist, spin, I can imagine a lot of things on my own. I can build a wall between me and the Holy Spirit who is knocking on the door always. I'd like to just, again, let go, let God, don't worry about it. It's out of my hands. So our calling as disciples is this middle ground, trusting in God, but also exerting ourselves, exerting ourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us where God is going. Yes, it's been Jesus here on earth with his immediate presence to show us where to go and what to do and how to do the things that we are to do. And now we have to figure it out on our own. One of the first things we're asked to do in the baptismal covenant is to keep the fellowship, keep the sacraments, Keep in prayer. This gospel reading as Jesus ascends is Jesus in prayer. 
something Jesus does a lot of. As one of the commentaries talked about, Jesus' brief time on earth must have felt like he should be doing things, wrapping things up, one more message, one more good deed, ever busy because time is short. But one of the most important things that Jesus does in his time on earth is the life of prayer. And let that be a lesson to us. We're in this time alone. We feel alone. We feel isolated. Can we ask the Spirit's presence into our lives to relieve that loneliness? Our prayer books offer us that opportunity. We have prayers in the morning, prayers at noon, prayers in the evening, compline. The day can be filled with prayer. Our connection to the Spirit can be made stronger and stronger. So here we are, in the world, Jesus has ascended, we are here. Jesus is in heaven. This is necessary. He can't stay to do the work. It's up to us now. So how's this working for us? Can we imagine the end of life as Jesus has been talking. The end clear and present. Glory, Jesus says. I'm about to go into glory. Jesus leaves us a legacy. All that he has been, all that he has done, is now kept for us in our hearts, kept for the disciples first, and then for the world. Jesus asks God to continue to protect us, asks us to continue unity. What unites us as members of one human family. We may be one as Jesus and God are one, as Jesus and his followers are one. In this time, described, it seems, by the letter to, of Peter, described so well, in this time, we are called to be the same. In many ways, the world has suddenly become one. Maybe with great fear. We are united in a way. Are we happy about that? The Dalai Lama, through his good friend Archbishop Desmond Tutu, has talked about the opportunity to turn our struggles into opportunities. Jesus has talked time and again about all the world, and not just the few. So with this time of unity pressed upon us, can we look to the power of God to become the power of us with the power of the Holy Spirit? And it's not for ourselves that we seek glory. It's not for some good outcome, even. This is for God's glory. Jesus' glory. Jesus' glory. He is talking about the cross. This time of testing is a time we should pray, yes, but it's a time to act in unity. I mean, truly, the whole world is in this together. And so, we hear so much disunity, discord, even about how we should protect ourselves. The governor of North Dakota said something heartening. He said, whatever our take is, and everybody has their ideas, all have relevance, should be listened to, but he says, the things we do should not be about me, should not be about you, whether I'm right or whether you're right. We should think of our ailing grandmother. We should think of our grandchild who is recovering from leukemia. 
Whatever we do, we do for them. Because again, we are united in this strange and yet special way through this season. Again, the words of Peter, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking a place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. May this be so. In Jesus' name, amen.